The 2019 NFL Draft featured four quarterbacks taken within the first 42 picks, three of which were selected in the first half of the first round. Now, four and a half years later, we're going to take a look and see how each of these guys have performed to this point, as well as briefly look and see how some of the guys from the later rounds have done, including the surprise quarterback of the class. So let's kick things off with possibly the most unique number one pick ever. There is Kyla Murray, resplendent in his homage to Leonardo DiCaprio in The Great Gatsby. If you've ever listened to any NFL talk related to quarterbacks, height is always a massive contributing factor. Even Baker Mayfield coming out of college, being around six foot to six foot one, was seen as an issue. So with Murray's abnormally short height for a quarterback, this made him all the more interesting. He's listed at five foot 10, which some believe is still being generous. Murray was recognized as some sort of blend between Baker Mayfield, Johnny Menzel, and Russell Wilson, except more athletic and having a better arm than all three. And he's going up top for Fitzgerald, and Fitzgerald makes the catch! Because the game has transformed so much over the previous decade with RPO concepts, Murray was seemingly the right prospect at the right time. And throw in the fact that he's insanely quick and elusive, and you have a potential matchup nightmare. He's also similar to a guy like Lamar Jackson in the sense that he's tough to prep for for opposing teams, since it's pretty difficult to replicate his playstyle in practice. But maybe as unique a prospect that Murray was, the situation he entered with the Cardinals was just as bizarre. The team had literally just drafted Josh Rosen 10th overall the year before. Do you think Rosen will regret saying this? Well, yes, I do, because I think he's an idiot. And things went so poorly with him that the team fired their head coach and traded Rosen to the Dolphins after just a single season. Even with Murray, the 2019 Cardinals were only expected to win five games, which is exactly what happened. But the bright spot was Murray's play. Point is Murray on the run here, gets away from two guys. It was clear that his game translated to the pros as he went on to win Rookie of the Year. Looking to improve the roster in 2020, the Cardinals acquired Pro Bowl wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins from the Texans in what many consider to be one of the worst trades ever from the perspective of the Texans. I mean, my head just blew up like a cartoon. Boof! Are you joking? The Murray to Hopkins connection was a huge success, highlighted by a monstrous debut in week one, as well as the play dubbed the Hail Murray. Slips a tackle, got to launch it. He does. Zone jump ball, and it is. Is it caught? Is it caught? Oh my goodness, it's caught! DeAndre Hopkins caught it! He caught it for a touchdown with one second left! 10 weeks into the 2020 season, and Murray was a legit MVP candidate. The Cardinals were 6-3, looking destined for the playoffs. However, things stalled out from this point. The team lost five of their last seven. Murray suffered a shoulder injury and continued to play, but wasn't the same. And they missed the playoffs. Still, this was a nice improvement over the previous season. 2021, building this roster around Murray seemed to be complete. The team offensively and defensively had developed pieces all over, and the acquisitions of all pros J.J. Watt and wide receiver A.J. Green made this team look like a contender in the NFC. And once things got rolling, they traded for tight end Zach Ertz. And through seven games, the Cardinals jumped out to an undefeated start. Wide open, he hit Zach Ertz. Touchdown, Arizona. Murray was now not just an MVP candidate, but the front runner. This is what the Cardinals had envisioned when they brought him in back in 2019. Kyler Murray limps off the field as this just collapsed for Arizona. The Cardinals suffered another late season collapse. Murray sprained his ankle and missed three games. And when he came back, things were just off as a whole. Their defense struggled to slow teams down and their offense had multiple duds. Even though they managed to make the playoffs for the first time since 2015, there was a bad omen with this team. In Kyler Murray's lone playoff game to this point in his career, he threw a brutal pick six, and they got blown out by the Rams. Kyler! Did he get rid of it? It's intercepted! After the game, a lot of the blame was placed on head coach Cliff Kingsbury. His offense was proven to be fool's gold that collapsed in back-to-back -back years. But the worst was to come, as the offseason following the 2021 playoff loss was full of drama. First, Kyler Murray deleted all references toward the Cards organization on his social media accounts. 
which became a main point on sports talk shows. In a very Gen Z gamer type FaZe Clan move, Kyler Murray deleted all the Arizona Cardinal stuff from his Instagram. What's FaZe Clan taking shots? Yeah, yeah. Baby. Despite this, the two parties agreed to a $230 million extension in July. However, the most talked about aspect of the contract was the clause that required Murray to study film for four hours a week, implying that he barely did it on his own. If he's watching film the way he's supposed to, if he's studying the way he's supposed to, this never even reached the contract. The MYT New York Times profile continued to say, sometimes when he needs a break, he turns his eyes to his favorite movie, The Great Gatsby. I'm Gatsby. <laughs> His whenever, favorite movie is The I, Great I, Gatsby? <laughs> in his homage to Leonardo DiCaprio in The Great Gatsby. Like, it's his favorite movie? Immediately I would have questions about this guy. That. And of course, the memes flew. After a bunch of backlash, the Cardinals removed the clause, but the PR damage was done. To think that I can accomplish everything that I've accomplished in my career um, and not be a student of the game, it's disrespectful. And it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost a joke. For the regular season, it was a complete disaster. D-Hop had been suspended. Murray openly criticized Kingsbury's play calling. Former teammate Patrick Peterson questioned Murray's character. Kyler Murray don't care about nobody but Kyler Murray. <laughs> and Murray then tore his ACL mid-season. The team would go on to finish with a 4-13 record. This led to Kingsbury being fired. And in just one year, the Cardinals went from a playoff team to pretty much entering a rebuild. Overall, we are in the midst of year five. Murray has proven to be a Pro Bowl level talent, but because of all the baggage of the last few years, it's hard to project what will happen next. Will he stay in Arizona throughout the rebuild? Or will he eventually be traded? Let me know what you think down below. Also, Murray's still trying to recover from that ACL injury in 2022, so this season is all but over for the Cardinals. So if I'm Coach Gannon, I, he's my guy who's just going to be rehabbing the rest of the season because the season is pretty much lost. The initial reaction to Daniel Jones being selected sixth overall was outrageous. Oh my God! Oh my! You gotta be kidding me! No! Why would you do that? Oh my God! Oh my God! I saw this comment on Reddit about it. Quote. The reaction to the pick is still one of the wildest things I've ever seen from the NFL fan base. Not just Giants fans, everyone. It was as if they picked some no-name that was going to go undrafted and at best end up on a practice squad. Almost immediately, people started making the obvious comparison to the team's quarterback, Eli Manning. The question is how healthy can he stay and can he get over his fumbling issues? And even though he got those comparisons to Eli, Jones was a closer resemblance skill-wise to Ryan Tannehill. In a lot of ways, Daniel Jones was the opposite prospect to who we previously mentioned, Kyler Murray. Tall, not flashy, more of a game managing type as opposed to a high ceiling playmaker. But overall, the year was a mixed bag. He's in! Touchdown! He led the league with a staggering 19 fumbles. Also, the team struggled to win many games. For the Giants, they have two wins, and one of them is because the kicker for the Bucks just pushed a, a field goal that would have won the game. That's right. I mean, well, look at that as the coming out party for Daniel Jones. And it was. Yeah, but the Bucks could have won the game. But at least there was hope. There was many Giants fans that felt they could trust the process with Daniel Jones. However, no matter who you are, when you get a bad coach, there's little you can do to overcome that. If you want to win games, you have to be a physical team. You got to run the ball, stop the run, and cover kicks. Interesting formation. I, I mean, really, I mean, this is sad. I mean, that that is just a, a complete lack of confidence in faith of your offense to be able to execute. Year two was rough. Despite the defense making major improvements, Jones's production slowed way down. He had much less touchdowns than the previous year, and it got even worse the following season. While the guy picked ahead of him ranked 8th by NFL.com in quarterback rankings after 2021, Jones was 24th. Here was how he was summarized as a player to that point. It's impossible to overstate how poor his protection and coaching have been, and he's shown enough flashes for me to believe he could be an average starter. Once again, another coaching change was made, which meant that Daniel Jones had three head coaches in four years. This isn't the best formula in building a solid foundation for a team or a quarterback. 
But under Brian Dable, things looked immediately better. Despite the lowest passing yards per game of his career, Jones's quarterback rating, QBR, completion percentage, and lack of turnovers were all career highs. Dable also helped Jones take his rushing ability to the next level. The icing on the cake was that this team finally made the playoffs for the first time since 2016, where they surprisingly beat the Vikings on the road before getting blown out by the Eagles. Now, despite the biggest year of his career, Jones still only ranked 18th, according to NFL.com, amongst starting quarterbacks. After the Giants gave him a four-year, $160 million extension, criticism was thrown at the franchise because people don't see a very high ceiling with Daniel Jones. So why pay him? Danny Dimes' deal gets done four minutes before the franchise. I think it was five minutes before the franchise tag yes. deadline at four. They close it. I, I think this is a big waste of money for the Giants. Nothing, not, nothing yep. against <laughs> D. Jones. He's a, a, a good player, but that's a lot of money. While many had remained hopeful after that better 2022 season, things have turned completely upside down in 2023. The Giants look terrible. It's as if what they had been working on the year before had completely vanished. So ultimately, in four and a half seasons, the best we've seen from Daniel Jones is an average NFL starter. Giants fans, what do you think is going to happen with your quarterback moving forward? To be honest, I'm unsure of how to talk about Dwayne Haskins. It feels weird to really dive into his brief NFL career due to his tragic death. But for the sake of context, for the class as a whole, I'll very briefly lay out his pro career. Coming out of Ohio State, Haskins was a big, strong prospect. More on the strong side as opposed to the athletic side, comparing to Drew Bledsoe. His two years in Washington were tough. The team was in a transition period in multiple ways, and at times, Haskins had his moments. Haskins throws, and he finds his man. Including NFL Rookie of the Week honors, as well as being named team captain going into 2020. But after multiple incidents of breaking COVID protocols, as well as the coaches being unimpressed with his work ethic, the two parties went their separate ways near the end of the regular season. When I look at Dwayne Haskins, I did see a lot of youth in him and didn't see, and I did see that he was not ready to be in a national football game. Haskins signed with the Steelers in 2021 and never appeared in a game for them before his tragic passing in 2022, where he was fatally struck by a vehicle. Regardless of what had taken place in the last few years, this man was only 24 years old. Rest in peace, Dwayne Haskins. Ninth play of the drive. Haskins steps up, looking around. He's going to throw it. Touchdown for the Washington. The last player I'll cover in any major depth is the only second round quarterback of the class, Drew Locke. Locke looking end zone for Sutton. Touchdown! Initially, he was scouted as a round one prospect, comparing to Matt Stafford due to his high end size and arm talent but concerns over his lack of accuracy and in-game presence made him a true boom or bust talent, which many aired on the side of bust, which is why he fell outside of the first round to the Broncos at pick number 42. He's got a huge arm, he trusts it a little bit too much and he needs to improve on his footwork. Guys, he's gonna have time. The Broncos, meanwhile, had brought in the defensive-minded Vic Fangio to help lead the team and veteran quarterback Joe Flacco to help the quarterback room. Locke had a good chance of starting day one, but suffered a thumb injury in the preseason and was placed on IR just before the regular season began. Once he got off IR, Denver immediately named him the starter versus the Chargers. It was an ugly game, but Locke managed to lead the game-winning drive via a pass interference and game-winning field goal. Then, after a big 300-yard and three-touchdown performance in Week 14, it looked like Locke had officially arrived. In five starts, he ended his rookie year 4-1, and one, and he went viral for rapping to the song Put On by Young Jeezy on the bench before the start of the second half of their final game. Things looked promising entering year two. However, another early season injury led to Locke missing two games. When he returned, it was pretty rough. In 13 starts, Locke was near the bottom of the NFL statistically with a woeful 75 quarterback rating, a low completion percentage, and 15 interceptions. He'd have a random breakout game here and there, but it usually came in between multiple bad performances. For 2021, the Broncos brought in Teddy Bridgewater to battle for the starting job, which Bridgewater won. 
Walker did start three games, but it was much of the same as 2020. Going into 2022, the Broncos knew they needed a major change to the quarterback position. Blockbuster. After weeks of negotiations and one of the largest trades in NFL history, the Seattle Seahawks and Denver Broncos have agreed to terms on a deal involving Super Bowl winning quarterback Russell Wilson. Currently, Locke is the backup to Geno Smith. For the rest of the 2019 class, there were seven other quarterbacks selected in the later rounds, most of whom were backups at best who started a small handful of games. There's already a few guys out of the league, and only one has surprised everybody, Gardner Minshew. In 2019, the Jags were expected to tank, but then Minshew got in there and put up a shocking 21 touchdowns to six interceptions in 12 starts. Minshew looking deep for Chark, he's got him, touchdown! Currently, he's now on his third team. Minshew is shown to be a pretty serviceable placeholder starter for the Colts. He's probably never gonna be a great starter, but he's an awesome backup to have. Also, it's worth mentioning that there were 35 undrafted quarterbacks in 2019 that were picked up after the draft. Most of whom never made a roster and only four ever even appeared in a game. So overall, this class was pretty underwhelming, mixed with drama and tragedy. Murray is really the only hit and things have been pretty turbulent in Arizona. But hey, at least we got this generation's Ryan Fitzpatrick. Minshew, hanging in there. Stays on his feet again, dancing around. Dodging tackles now, throws end zone, caught, touchdown! Minshew magic! 